So now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to go back with me into the year 1861. And welcome to our stage, Mountain Man Jim Beckworth. Are there any lawyers here? I live in San Francisco, and I'm thinking about moving back to Denver. And last year, I made a deal with Mr. Thomas Bonner Esquire, a lawyer. And he told me that if I told him my story, the story of my life, he would take it down. And he did so. And he wrote a book, The Autobiography of James P. Beckworth. And Harper Brothers in New York published it. And the next year, they published it again in England. And I understand they're going to publish it in France, in French, soon. <coughs> I was supposed to get half of the proceeds from this. <laughs> I haven't seen anything. I'm not sure about the, these tricky lawyers. Is anybody here from Marysville? Six years ago, Marysville could have been the capital of the new California. Gold was discovered. I had found some years before the lowest pass across the Sierras, an old Indian track, and I made a deal with the mayor that if I built the road and made sure that road went all the way over the Sierras, to the Nevada country desert, that he would pay me $1,600. Well, I got $200 when I finished the road because Marysville had a fire in 1855 over the winter. And they said they couldn't pay me. Now, if some of you can help me, I don't know what the interest rates would be, but <laughs> we could make a tidy sum. Well, I'm thinking about leaving California. I've enjoyed it here. And this is not my first time in California. I was down in the south twice, once very far south, near the little pueblo of Los Angeles. I don't think it's ever going to amount to anything. <laughs> I just a dusty little place. And you know, they accused me of stealing horses. Now this was when the war started between Mexico and the United States. And I knew, I had information that the war might take a long time. And I had worked as a scout before. And I knew that the United States was going to need horses. And the headquarters of the United States Army was in Santa Fe. So with a group of my fellow mountain men, we appropriated, if you will, about 400 horses. And we drove them across the desert to Santa Fe and gave them to the army. Now, for several days, some of the Californios followed me. They didn't quite see that this was an act of war and that I was a patriot. Now, I've been known for stealing horses before, but now people will say many things about you, I suppose, when they don't know you well. And I want you to understand that I am not a horse thief. Well, not exactly. <laughs> you see, I lived with the Crow tribe for more than seven years. And part of the way life was on the plains in those days, back in the 1820s, is that horses were wealth. If you had to travel across the Great Plains and you had to walk at three miles an hour, it would take you a long time to go anywhere. But now if you could ride a good horse, that made all the difference in the world. 
I understand the Constitution says all men are created equal. Well, now, if you believe that, you should spend time afoot when everyone around you is riding a good horse. <laughs> and we'll see just how true that is. Well, I grew up in the Illinois country, a bit north of St. Louis. My father, Jennings, had come out from Virginia, where he'd married my mother, who was a slave. And as you can imagine, that didn't make him very popular among his neighbors in Frederick County in Virginia. So he decided, oh, about 1808 or so, I was 10 years old, that we would come out to the Illinois country. This was new country, and a man could claim land. And my father was a farmer, and he had 13 children. There were seven boys and six girls. I was the third oldest. And he thought there would be a better future for us. And, well, it's still there, the settlement. It's called Beckwith's Landing. So if you're ever in that country, you might, uh, I understand that Illinois is a state now, but uh, since 1818, but, uh, well, it wasn't much of a state, which is why I went west. Are there any school teachers here? We've got one. Well, I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> but I went to school for four years, and I just thought that was enough for anybody. <laughs> I learned to read. I learned to write. Well, I didn't read very well. But I could write my name, and I could do some figuring. And it helped me in my business. So I thought I had all the education I needed. Of course, I wasn't smart enough to tie my knife on. <laughs> but my father thought, since I didn't do well in school, I didn't like it, I did okay. But, and no offense to the teachers, I'm sure the teachers are, are much better than the ones in St. Louis. He apprenticed me to a Mr. George Kastner, a blacksmith in St. Louis, because he thought that would be a good trade. I could learn to be a blacksmith, I'd be able to make my living in the world. Well, St. Louis was a, not a very big, big town at that time. And about 1815, of course, all the mountain men, all the fur trapping companies, all of the goods that came down the Ohio and the Missouri, all gathered in St. Louis. The mountain men needed wagons and harnesses and shoeing for their horses. And of course, the, the river boatmen needed oar locks made. And the new farmers, they needed hinges for their gates. So all of these things were done by the blacksmith. You can order things now in the Sears and Roebuck catalog. The, uh, and it's, 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 a, it's a good catalog. It has lots of things in it. But if you needed something to fit exactly, you went down to the blacksmith shop. So a man could make a good living as a blacksmith. I didn't like it. <laughs> now the blacksmith assistant, he gets up early in the morning. And he starts the fire. He stokes it. He gets it warmed up. And then during the day, when Mr. Kasner and his partner, John L. Sutton, come in, of course the apprentice works the bellows. Morning, noon, afternoon, evening, all day he works the bellows to make sure the fire is hot enough to work the iron. And at the end of the day, who do you think cleans up? <laughs> you have to put the fire out. You have to clean the hearth. You have to clean the tools. You have to clean up the shop. Then you can go off and go to bed. It made for a very long day. I didn't like blacksmithing. Well, I worked with Mr. Kasner for almost four years. And we, we seemed to, I got pretty good at the, at the work. It wasn't that difficult. I was smart enough to do some figuring and understood how the iron work needed to be done. And I actually thought, as many young men do, that I had mastered this trade, and incidentally, almost everything else that one needs to know in life. <laughs> well, after all, I was 22 years old. How much more of a man could you be? What else could there be to learn? I had finished school, I had finished what I thought was a good apprenticeship, and was ready to make my way in the world as something other than a blacksmith. And 
I developed a few friends in the neighborhood nearby the shop. And these friends seemed to frequent establishments where strong liquor was served. And, well, there were women there as well. I don't want to say anything to frighten you ladies, but as a young man, let's just say St. Louis was a rowdy town, and I managed to fit in pretty well with the rowdiness. <laughs> Mr. Kasner objected to this. He thought that my evenings should have been spent after work was done, perhaps reading the Bible, getting a good night's sleep so I was ready to come to work in the morning. And he had the effrontery, can you imagine, to tell me that? He wasn't happy with what I was doing, how I was living my life. He wasn't my father. And, well, I objected. And I made some of those objections rather clear to him. Well, now, being a man of great physical strength, Mr. Kashner picked up a hammer and he threw it at me. Can you imagine? Well, of course, I was young and strong. That was more than 40 years ago. I picked up the anvil and I threw it back at him. <laughs> well, that ended my blacksmith career, <laughs> as you can well imagine. Now, Moses Harris was a man who came into the blacksmith shop. He was a fur trapper, and he worked for General William Ashby of the Rocky Mountain Fur Trading Company. And while he was making his orders and waiting to receive things that were being made for him at the shop, he talked about the West, the fastness of the Great West, the plains, the Rocky Mountains, the high Sierras, all the places that he had been. And he also told me why he was important to the, to the brigade, to the Trapper Brigade. You see, Moses could speak sign. So all of the companies were interested in using him because as you moved west from one tribe to another and on to another, if you were not able to talk, you could not trade. And not only could you not trade, you could not buy your toll and go through the land of these people. So Moses was a very important man. And he took a liking to me. And I love to hear these stories. So I told my father several times I was interested in perhaps another life. <coughs> now after that incident with the hammer and the anvil, the, uh, I, I repaired to my boarding house. And wouldn't you know, sometime later, a one-armed policeman came to see me. Now, I knew what he wanted. But now, come on, a one-armed policeman? <laughs> I loaded my pistol, went down the stairs, and I confronted him. And I told him I knew what he wanted and that Kasner was wrong, that he had said things to me that one man should not say about another unless he intends to fight. And that I thought any action by the police to defend him would put them in the same position and that I was ready to deal with that. And of course, he could see my loaded pistol. I cocked it. He backed away. Now, I assume he went off to find another policeman and some more help and would be back. I decided to leave and I spent three days hiding at the house of a friend and then I went home. The Beckwith Landing was about 20 miles north of St. Louis on the Illinois side of the river. So I went to see my father. I told him what had happened. And he said he would be happy to come to see Mr. Kastner and perhaps make amends and get my job back. I could be reapprenticed and, and we could go on. And I told him I wasn't interested. But Moses Harris was going up to, with the army, Colonel Robbins, he was going up to the, the Fox River Valley near a place later called Starved Rock, and the army was going to make a treaty. And this would take, oh, maybe a month, a little more, to uh, go up river and to have these talks. And I was invited to go along as the wrangler. I could take care of the horses. Since I had this training as a blacksmith, everyone thought I would be useful. Well, I didn't say much, I didn't say no. 
I went along, but I really had no intention of taking care of the horses, certainly not as a blacksmith. But we got up to the Illinois country up north, and I stayed after the peace treaty was made, but I did see how useful Moses was in learning sign. So I tried to pay attention to what he was doing, and I began to learn sign myself. But when the expedition was over and the army came back to St. Louis, I stayed on in that country about five months. I hunted for a mining company that was there because now that peace had been made with the Sac and the Fox people, businesses were able to flourish and the town of Galena was created. And people began to do business in Galena along the river, trading with, with people from up further north, providing goods and services in that direction, and, and also some trade along the, the Fox River and the Illinois River with a little town called Fort Dearborn that's, well, since developed into Chicago, which I believe means bad smell in the Fox <laughs> language. Well, it was a swampy place. I don't know if it's improved any. I haven't been there. And, in, uh, in that territory in many years, but uh, well, it didn't smell very good, but, but most swamps don't, don't smell good, and, and of course you people know that. Well, when I came back from the Fox River country, I knew that I wanted a life in the wilderness, that there was something better than being a blacksmith assistant. So I talked to my father, he gave me some money, and said if that's really what I wanted to do, he wasn't for it, but that if it was really what I wanted to do, he would support me in it. And he made an introduction to General Ashley, who had already heard about me from, from Moses Harris. And old Moses told the general, of course, that I could take care of the horses. So I was hired on as a wrangler in 1822 and went west with the expedition that year. Now, General Ashley, usually took 50 to 150 men with him on these excursions, and they would stay out about a year. He had two kinds of employees, those who were in the brigade who traveled with him, who trapped for him. So they were his furs when you trapped them, his peltry. Then he had men who were called free trappers, now, they traveled with him sometimes, but usually these men stayed in the West. He built five forts, and the furthest West was the one called the Yellowstone. And at that fort, he left people, as he did at the others, and he had it was his own small empire, you might say. There were men who stayed at these forts who worked for him. There were other men who lived at the fort or around the forts who were free trappers. And of course, during the off season, during the, the summer months, many of the Indian tribes nearby, the, the Plains Indians, would come and live there because they traded, it was a comfortable place, they could see the comings and goings and enjoyed that. Well, of course, as you look at these five forts going west, these are very different people that he's dealing with, and he has problems sometimes with these people. They don't want to trade, or they want to trade, but they don't want to trade with anyone else. Well, St. Louis itself had started as a trading center with the French and the Spanish, and they didn't want the Americans trading. So he certainly understood this rivalry between traders. Well, now, this was all about fur, beaver fur. It was very, very valuable. Great fortunes were made. The Astor fortune, of course, was made the Hudson Bay Company, and we were competing with Hudson Bay trappers who came down in the, the Montana Territory, the Wyoming Territory, so they were there even though they were a, a British and Canadian organization, and we had to compete with them, and the American Fur Trading Company. But I joined General Ashley, ostensibly as a wrangler, someone to take care of the horses, but on the first expedition, as we started out, of course, the first two or three hundred miles, the horses don't need much in the way of shoeing. So there wasn't very much for me to do in camp. But 10 or 12 of his men would ride out 
a day or two days in front of the brigade, and they would hunt fresh meat. They would provide the game that fed the brigade. As you can imagine, 150 men eat a lot of meat. Some days, a man would eat 10 pounds of meat. <clears throat> and after about a month or so, of course, you were out of everything else. The flour was gone, except, of course, for sugar and coffee. Those were two very valuable things. You hoarded those if you had them personally. And of course, General Ashley had them as trade goods as well on the wagons that we took west. Well, I went out ahead with the hunters. That was allowed because there wasn't much for me to do with the horses in camp. And the hunters carried two loaded pocket rifles apiece. And now, I don't know about your time, but in my day, when you shoot at a deer and miss, it doesn't usually stand still and wait for you to shoot again. So the hunters would have a second rifle so they could take another shot. Now, I was responsible for keeping the rifles loaded for the group of hunters that I was with. So they would fire one rifle, hand that to me, I would load it, they'd fire the other, and by that time I'd have the, uh, the second rifle loaded. But now when there are four or five of these men that you're working with, uh, of course this kept me very busy. Well, as they would move and get a little bit away from me, one of those days, there was a clear shot at a deer very close to me, but the hunter had walked off maybe 20 or 30 paces, so I could run and carry the gun for him, and I was a good shot, or I could take the shot myself. And I did. And when the deer was felled, one of the largest ones we'd had that day, it hadn't been a good hunting day, I was proclaimed to be one of the hunters. And they went back, told General Ashley what a good shot I was. And from that time on, I got to stay with the hunters. And I really enjoyed it. Well, we were crossing a river in the Nebraska country. And General Ashley, now I don't know about your generals. And we've got a lot of them now with the war starting in the South. But generals tend to be old, fat men. <laughs> a little clumsy getting on their horses, a little slow walking. While I understand the commanding general of the United States Army, Winfield Scott, weighs 350 pounds. They carry him to the White House in a chair that's loaded on a wagon. Well, now, General Ashley wasn't quite that big, but he was an older man, and he didn't ride all that well. He was a very good shot. He didn't ride all that well, and he couldn't swim. Well, crossing in the spring, as you can imagine, sometimes you've got fast-moving water. The water's high. And General Ashley's horse stumbled, and he fell off. But those fancy St. Louis boots he was wearing had a spur that caught on the stirrup. So he was being dragged under. He doesn't swim. The horse is now spooked because he has stumbled. And General Ashley was having a hard time. Well, I was mounted on a very good horse. I got out to where he was, and I took out my knife, and I cut the stirrup strap. Well, he was quite upset, because with those fancy boots, he also had a fancy saddle that was imported all the way across the ocean from England. And it was rather expensive. He wasn't happy with me having done this. But he realized that this had saved his life. Well, he had a small folding knife with a white bone handle that he gave me as a present for as much for saving his life as the words he had mentioned afterwards for cutting his saddle. <laughs> and I was very proud of that knife. In fact, the Blackfeet, who were the first people that I met and really stayed with, we had passed through the, the, the country of the Arikara, the, the Arapaho, and other tribes, but the Blackfoot, who were near Yellowstone, uh, I stayed with them for a while, several months. And because I was so proud of this knife and had it with me all the time, they gave me the name White Handle Knife. That was my first Indian name. Now, names on the Great Plains are very important. Most of the, for most of these tribes, the name of a person is sacred. And it's not used the way we use names 
in the American country. A mother, for example, would not say to her children, Michael, Tom, come in, it's time for dinner. She would say, because the names are sacred and are to be used with great respect, even to children, she would perhaps say, if my children are not interested in dinner, soon, perhaps I will throw it away. Well, they would get the message. You didn't have to use the name. Now, you would typically have three names. When you were born, you were given a name by your family, which recognized your position. If you were the youngest son or the oldest daughter, you would get a name that might reflect that, or the spirit guide of one of your parents. If the spirit guide of a parent was a deer, for example, the first daughter might be known as Swift Deer. The youngest son might be known as Fast Wolf. When you were 12 or 13, you were officially inducted into the tribe. And if your tribe had a warrior society, like the, the Crow, the Blackfoot, uh, the Arapaho, these societies would bring you in and accept you as a man in the tribe with responsibilities, even though you were only 12. You would be given a bow, uh, typically made by an older brother or perhaps an older sister. Uh, you would get the other implements of war, a, a knife, a, a, a war ax, uh, and you might even get your first horse as a present from your family at this point. But you would also be given a name and you would accept your own spirit guide. And that name would reflect what you thought of yourself. So Swift Wolf might be known as Running Deer because the deer was the spirit guide for this young man. Now, after you were in one of these warrior societies for a time and you began to count coup or do other deeds such as being a great hunter at buffalo season, you would be given a name by your fellow members of that warrior clan. And that name would be the one that stayed with you for the rest of your life because it would reflect not only who you were, but what you were to the tribe. So this, these names were very, very important. But as I say, the name is sacred and it wasn't used easily the way we think of, for example, a nickname. You wouldn't do that because the name was so important and it recognized the spirituality, particularly of a warrior and of anyone in one of these tribes. Well, I spent some time, as I said, with the Blackfeet at Yellowstone. And there was a problem at Yellowstone because the fort that General Ashley had built was in the middle of tribal area between the Blackfoot and the Crow. Well, the Blackfoot and the Crow had been enemies since time immemorial. No one knew why they were enemies, but they were. And there was no work this out. So if you had both tribes at the fort at the same time, trading with one would create tension and jealousy with the other. Trading with the other could create a situation where one tribe wanted to fight the other because they thought they were getting something that they shouldn't deserve. Now the trade goods that we took west with the brigades would consist mostly of metal objects, knives, hatchets, cooking pots, for example, sometimes beads or glassware, and other trade goods like blankets. And the red blanket, since on the plains with the berries and other things that grow that can be made into dye, the color red is very difficult to make. So a red blanket would typically be worn across the shoulders in the daytime by a chief, by a war chief, or a medicine man. And it would signify great power, great medicine, that you have that. And I, I don't know how to translate medicine for you. It's a difficult term. We don't have an equivalent in English. But medicine would be a combination of good luck, of intelligence, of understanding, and most of all, wisdom that was granted to you by the Great Spirit. 
So to say a man had great wisdom meant that he was someone with powerful medicine, that this could be someone you wanted as your medicine man or as your chief or your war chief because their medicine was strong. Well, the second year I went out, and medicine comes into play, 1823, the Crow were camped at Yellowstone. And a man named Greenwood, who was a friend of Moses Harris, and there was always joshing between the mountaineers around camp or at the fort. That's just how we got along. And we would find out a weakness that someone had or an interest someone had or the name of a girlfriend back in St. Louis. And we would pick on each other and we would play jokes on each other. Well, I had done a few deeds at the fort and was getting a bit of a reputation, a good shot, a favorite of General Ashley's because I'd saved his life a second time uh, when he was chased by a bear and fell off his horse, wouldn't you know it again? <laughs> so, Greenwood told one of the Crow women, one of the older Crow women, that that man over there, meaning me, pointing at me, that man over there is a Crow who was raised by white people back east. <laughs> and you remember, he would go on to say, the great raid of the Cheyenne some years ago. And of course, everyone remembered because the, the, the Cheyenne had come. Now, the Cheyenne, you must understand, on the plains were supermen. They were 10 feet tall. They had horses that could jump over rivers at one bound. They were, these were the people that were feared and respected by all the other plains Indians in the northern plains. And this great horse raid, where horses were stolen, but also people were taken into slavery by the Cheyenne, was something that all the Crow, and for that matter, the Arikara, the Blackfoot, uh, that they all remembered having taken place because a number of children were taken. Well, after, and Greenwood was a man who was considered to have strong medicine, and that he did not speak with a forked tongue. Everything, he wasn't a lawyer, by the way. <laughs> Everything that he would say could be believed. So, of course, a number of these ladies, these older ladies in the Crow tribe who had lost children or perhaps nephews, came to look at me. And they poked me and, and prodded me and took off my hat and, and looked at my, 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 my face and my ears because they were trying to identify me because they were absolutely sure Greenwood was telling the truth. Well, finally, one, one older woman came up to me, the wife of Big Bowl, who was a very important old warrior in the tribe, and thought that I resembled her son, who was taken away some years ago by the Cheyenne. And of course, it would be possible for me to have great medicine because I had this respect at the fort, but if I had been taken by the Cheyenne and then bought by the whites and raised by them, I would know things that the other tribe members didn't know. So I was identified clearly as her son because he had a mole over one eye. I happened to have a mole over an eye, but as I later found out, it's the different eye. <laughs> Mine's on the right and her son's was, were on the left. But clearly, Greenwood had stated the truth, so people tried to identify me, and Big Bull's wife did. So I was taken into the tribe. I now had a brother, four sisters, and of course, as a crow, having four sisters is a great responsibility. I now have to go steal horses so that I can pay their bride price when some brave wants to marry one of them. So not only do I need horses, back to horses again, right? That, that old problem. Well, I had come from further east. So I knew where the tribes to the east of the Crow hid their horses. Some had them in box canyons. Some moved them uh, with a separate small group so that they weren't kept with the main tribal body. Sometimes tribes would break up into bands, four or five bands, 
The Crow, being small, only had two bands. But there were tribes like the Pawnee, for example, that had, that had five bands. Well, I knew where their horses were kept. So when we would go on horse raids, and we always did this afoot, so that you stole the horse and you rode back. And the strongest medicine is when none of the raiding party was killed, and you either counted coup, stole horses, or brought scalps back uh, of men you had fought on these raids. Well, I could do very well because I had much greater knowledge than most of the other raiding parties would have. Now, when I joined Big Bull's family, my brother was in the dog soldier clan. So I was automatically a member of the dog soldier clan being in that family. So I was asked to go on a raid very soon thereafter. And General Ashley was happy. At the, Captain Sublett, who stayed at the fort year round, working for General Ashley, he was happy with this arrangement. Because if I lived with the crow as a crow, I could help him trade. So I could make sure that the crow were willing to trade with Sublet and Ashley's company rather than with Hudson's Bay or with the, with the Rocky Mountain Fur Trading Company. So the American Fur Trading Company would, would make much better business. <clears throat> well now, given the situation I was in, I should be a rich man today. Because <laughs> I could control the prices, I could determine what was going on. Obviously, I spoke English, so I could take the pelts that were trapped by the Indians in addition to whatever trapping I could do myself because I was obviously a free trader now, but I was also paid by General Ashley. I made $300 a year for just living with the Crow and keeping the peace between them and the Blackfoot. So I would learn at the fort where the Blackfoot were camping and where they would be, be trapping in a certain season so I could lead the Crow in another direction so they wouldn't cross each other. Because if there was war, of course, there are businesses that, that just can't be done. Well, as I said, I stayed with the, with the Crow for seven years and had many adventures, but I missed my family. Remember, I had seven, there were seven boys and six girls. My sisters were getting married. And from time to time, of course, the trapping brigade, as they came out, they would bring news of the family back in St. Louis. So I wanted to go back. I went back in 1831 to the wedding of one of my sisters. And I realized my father by then had, had, had aged quite a bit. He had lost some of his land being a surety for other men. When they borrowed money, he would stand behind them. Lawyers again. Yeah. They would write these papers. Well, it wasn't his money, but he had guaranteed these other men and things would go poorly. And of course, he had given some of the land away to some of my brothers and sisters as they had gotten married. But he just looked old and haggard. So the next year, I also wanted to go back again. And I did so in, in the summer season when there was no trapping. And the next year, of course, the, the Seminole War was getting started in Florida. And the Army was looking for scouts. And in St. Louis, of course, if you needed scouts, you came to the mountain men who, if they at least knew the area, or knew the Indian cultures, they could be very useful. So I joined a comp company of the mountain men and I went as, on a keel boat as far as New Orleans where I contracted a fever. And I was sick for almost a month, but nursed back to health, and then took a ship to Florida where I stayed for all those two years and I worked for General Winfield Scott. Of course, he didn't weigh 300 pounds then. He was still a, a relatively young man. And the group of mountain men, there were 30 of us all together in the scouting company. What we did for the Army that they couldn't do for themselves is gave them the possibility of transmitting messages back and forth from one side of Florida to the other. The Seminole, of course, knew the way through the swampy areas and how to do that. And the Army would send 10 men with horses, and they would make noise, and all of those sorts of things. And the Navy, of course, would sail all the way around. Well, that would take approximately two to three weeks to sail around Florida. Well, a small group of mountain men, four or five, quietly could learn the trails, and we could get a message across in three or four days. 
from one group of the army to the other. So the scouts became very important. And of course later, the, the same thing in the Mexican War, the scouts would do the same sort of things. I worked with Kit Carson and one trip between Council Bluffs and Santa Fe, we made in 28 days. We would sleep during the day and we would ride all night so that we wouldn't be discovered. And we knew how the Indians lived. So at the end of the day, we would cook our meals, douse that fire, and then as it got dark, we would slip away for the next encampment in the morning that we would make. So it became very difficult to track us. And we would hide in the daytime when we would camp, and no fire until the evening when we were about ready to leave. So it was very difficult to find us. Well, a slave catcher came into camp one day, and I was alone with the horses. The other men were out hunting. Uh, I had, uh, for some reason, uh, was left behind. I was resting. And the slave catcher came over to where I was. He thought I was asleep, but I was watching him, and I had my rifle loaded by my leg. And as he picked up a hammer to hit me with, I don't think he was going to kill me because he wanted to sell me into slavery. As he picked up this hammer, I shot him. And just as I shot him, Kit Carson rode into camp. And the, the man was wounded badly. He wasn't killed. He was wounded badly. Carson tied him up over the horse like a corpse and sent the horse off into the wilderness. Uh, we never saw him again. Uh, and with that reputation, nor did I see any other slave catchers. Well. I came back to California after the Mexican War, and of course, I couldn't go in the South because those people had some questions about the title to a few horses, as I mentioned earlier. But we won't go into to, to that with too much detail. I made that arrangement, as I told you, with Marysville, and I still haven't gotten that the rest of my $1,600. So I finished the road the next year, and I made it a toll road. And I also opened up the first hotel between Salt Lake City and San Francisco. Well, that training I had as a blacksmith allowed me to build a blacksmith shop. So as the immigrants came through the Beckwith Valley along the Feather River, I could fix their, the hoops on their wagon wheels. And I had several blacksmiths that worked for me. I could shoe their horses. And I became a trader because if you brought grandma's favorite chair, but by that time your cow was dying, you might need a new cow. Well, I would take your old cow with a chair and maybe a quilt and a good blanket in trade. So the trading post would have a steady stream of goods coming from back east, and I could sell the cattle. A family would need a milking cow that maybe theirs had worn out coming across the, uh, the trails. And the books that I read, and some of them are very strange, about the, the immigrant trail and coming west, doesn't talk about the thievery that went on between rival trains, rival wagon trains. People would steal horses and cattle from another wagon train, or the, the wagon train would spread out. So the horses might be a mile, two miles, three miles ahead with the drover, or the cattle might be two or three miles behind, because people walked along next to the wagons being pulled by oxen. I see some of those pictures with horses pulling wagon. Horses did not pull wagons. You can't, have any of you got a horse that will pull a wagon? <laughs> now you can get an oxen to pull a wagon from St. Joseph, Missouri to Marysville, which should be the capital had they paid me for the road because <laughs> the pass is lower. It's, it's 5,000 feet. The Donner Pass is at 8,300 feet, and I understand sometimes the menu uh, along the Donner Pass can be a little, <laughs> a little rough. Well, had they paid me and Marysville paid attention, they would be a big city today instead of Sacramento. And of course, I guess the railroads have gone on to make that. But I understand my stage will be leaving soon for, uh, for San Francisco, and I'm going to have to go. But maybe some of you have a few questions about some of my life that we've talked about mm -hmm. that I can answer. Yes, ma'am. So, you said earlier about how you used to buy something for your sister, uh, in the meantime. Yes. Uh, why did you get uh, trained with the general? Okay, the question.
question is, with my four sisters, my four pro-sisters, I had to have horses for them. Why couldn't I just trade? Well, we did trade. We did do some trading, but you wouldn't have enough horses. If your sister was not as charming and as beautiful as you are, I might have to give another family 15 horses to take her. So it might be difficult. Now, if she were beautiful and intelligent and she could make beaded work uh, on, your, on your moccasins and, and make drums and dress down a buffalo hide, then you might not need quite so many horses to trade. But they were hard to get. There, there weren't new horses coming out from the east all the time like there were red blankets. You had to get the horses from other tribes. And this horse stealing was the way that things were done. It was just very, very common. So I was actually a great hero because I could steal lots of horses. My medicine was strong because my raids were successful and not many men would be killed. Or we could count coup because I knew where things were because I knew what was east of where the crow lived in a way that they couldn't ever know since I went back and forth on that trail. And of course I talked to the other mountain men who would tell me, but horses were very important. They were very important, but we couldn't just trade because they were expensive. And of course if I traded off my beaver pelts, I couldn't make a lot of money. There were years when I made $10,000 trading pelts. Remember Mr. Castor, the blacksmith? He had a very good business. St. Louis was growing. He made $250 a year. That's why people went west. Fur was very valuable. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Where did all that money go? Well, <laughs> have you been to a bar lately? <laughs> I did do some drinking. Now, I certainly saved some money. I had a sweetheart, Eliza, back in St. Louis. I had intended to marry her. But now remember, General Ashley and Captain Sublett thought it was a good idea for me to stay with the Crow. And every time, wouldn't you know it, that I got ready to leave and go back to civilization, something would happen and the Crow would need me. I also had three Crow wives eventually. <laughs> and supporting them, and it, was, it was hard to get out. It was hard to get out. But I did save some money, and uh, that was used to start some of the business ventures that I was in. I had a ranch in Santa Fe that was purchased with some of the money. And of course, I had to be kicked on Catholic to have a ranch in Santa Fe in the 1840s, before the Mexican War. Because this was Mexican territory, and only Catholics would be allowed to immigrate. So I needed money in terms of doing that. The trading post that I started in the Beckwith Valley, I needed money. Well, General Ashley sold the company to Mr. Sublet and several other gentlemen in 1832. So he made that rendezvous that year, announced that he was selling the company to them. He went back to St. Louis, where he could get those fancy boots and saddles, and he became a banker. In fact, his bank became the first national bank of Missouri. So he did very well. But then, you know, bankers, lawyers, they always do very well, but what happens to the other people with them? Yes, I, I have uh, children. One of my sons, Panther, is the chief of the minor band of the Crow. So the Crow have split into two bands. They've been reduced in number. There are about 3,000 now. The minor band, about 700 uh, people. Uh, Panther is the, uh, is the chief there. But I have other children as, as, as well, but, but that's the one that's important you're probably referring to. How many in total? Well, that's hard to say. You see, I also, <laughs> I, I had two wives when I lived, the, 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 the season I lived with the Blackfoot. And there wasn't any choice. I was offered these wives because I had done very good trading for them. And this, these were women who, they were daughters of the chief. So when the chief says, we like you as a man, we have great friendship and great reverence for you, you have strong medicine, you should have a wife and I have a daughter. If you said no, you could easily be killed. And remember, we're trading, the trading post is on their land. 
So we need to deal with them in ways culturally that they can understand. So I had to say, uh, I had to say yes. Now, I will tell you that, that some of the braves, some of the Blackfoot braves came into camp one night with the scalps of, of mountain men. It was clear that these were American scalps that they had taken. And my wife wanted to go to the scalp dance and I told her she could not do this. That these men might be friends of mine and I didn't want her to do it. And as my wife, she had to obey me. Well, gentlemen, you know how women are. <laughs> she went off to this dance. Well, I went out and I took a rock and I hit her. And I did this in front of the entire tribe. Everyone stopped and gasped. And of course, I had no idea. There were two other mountaineers with me. I had no idea what was going to happen. I walked back to, to my teepee and I stayed there for a, for a while. And her father came to see me. And we thought she was dead. And her father said I had done the right thing. I had given her an order. She was now part of my family and had to obey me. And I didn't want her to go to this dance. Now, one of the young men was her cousin, which is like a brother. First cousins, brothers were at the same level in terms of family. It was referred to as brother. So one of her cousins was one of the warriors who had taken these scalps. And this was very important in his life that the tribe recognized this. Well, he said that I would obviously need another wife. And he had a younger daughter who was better looking and more intelligent. And he offered her. So she was now my wife. Well, the next morning, when I woke up, wife number one, the older sister, was lying next to me uh, under the buffalo robe. That she had been dazed, but she wasn't dead. And she said she was back, and now that she was going to be more compliant and obedient, and that I should take her back. So that's how I got two, two Blackfoot wives. And of course, the next year when I came out, Mr. Greenwood and the story about me being a crow, and you know, now I'm a crow, so the Blackfoot wives are with their tribe. So you can understand why I'm not quite sure. <laughs> and then there was a Spanish wife in Santa Fe, and, and, uh, and there is a woman in Denver. I'm on my way to Denver. There is a woman in Denver that, that I've uh, been corresponding with. I met her in San Francisco some years ago, and, you know, who knows what, what may happen there. But, uh, it's, it's a good question. Yes, sir. During your travels, did you ever come through the Livermore Valley or into the Livermore Hills? Well, you've got names now that I don't necessarily recognize, but I trapped and traded and traveled through this entire area many times, and I went lots of places. Now, there are people, by the way, up in the Washington country near Canada who say that I stole horses there. I've never been to Washington. So, what can I say? I came through this area in many places. Uh, that name Livermore doesn't mean very much to me. I don't know that. But now, is there a pass there? Are there beaver uh, streams? Are there? <laughs> Sir, are you from there and you're missing horses? <laughs> <laughs> but I may have been there. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. The question is, what happened to the man that Kit Carson put on the horse? What happened to the horse and the value of the horse? Well, the horse belonged to the man who had come in to try to capture me. So it wasn't our horse. And we certainly had a sense, uh, even in the wilderness, a sense of honesty. We punished people who committed crimes, who committed transgressions and wrongdoing. Some 100 lashes with willow, with willow uh, switches, uh, which you'd leave you pretty well cut up if you did, if you stole from another man. A small group of mountain men can't tolerate a thief or a liar among their group. That just wouldn't work. You wouldn't, you wouldn't survive. But the, the horse, a, a good horse in 1840, a good riding horse, $20. Now, the further west you went, where horses were rare, the price would go up. They're selling beans now in the gold country for $5 a can. 
Beans are a nickel a can back in Boston, I'm told. But if you happen to have beans in the gold country, and a miner needs them, I mean, the real goal is with the merchants who are selling things to the miners, isn't it? That's why I'm going back into the business with a trading post in, in Denver. That's what I'm thinking about. That's where the real money is. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I understand there's a group called the Donner family that went across. The, why didn't they take your method, which was lower than their method? Why sir, I've got the same question. <laughs> Now, there's a man named Lansford Hastings, and I understand he has proclivities to go off with this new confederacy that started, but Mr. Hastings wrote a book called The Immigrant Trail, and he says you should leave Salt Lake no later than the 1st of May. The Donner Party left at the end of June. He says you should be crossed over the mountains no later than the beginning of October. They got to the mountains at the end of October, and that was a year with three times the normal snowfall. Now, had they just come my way, but of course, remember, it's a toll road. They'd have to pay. They'd have to pay. You know, I built this. I had to get my money back. Nobody, you're sure nobody's from Marysville that can help me with <laughs> well, They didn't do it. They didn't do it. It was a mistake that they made. They should have gone back when the snow hit. If they turned around and gone back to Carson City, they could have waited the winter out. It would have been difficult and expensive, of course. They'd have to use money and buy food, but, uh, and perhaps consume their animals. But they could have made it. They should have gone back. But they didn't. Now, if any of you are traveling over the mountains, and it's snowing in the Donner Pass, it may just be a little damp when you come through the Beckwith Pass and go along the Feather River. And it's a lot more beautiful. And you can see my cabin, which is, which is still there. I've just, uh, I've just left it. It hasn't been gone long. The hotel is not doing very well. It's not doing very well. I have tried to, is anybody interested in a bargain on a hotel? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we could, we could work something out. Yes, ma'am. Yes, could you uh, talk a bit about uh, trading herbs and medicine and how sick people will treat it in... Um, in the tribe that you live with. Okay, can I talk a bit about medicine and herbs and trading and how that worked? Well, Plains Indian tribes are theocracies. So medicine in the American sense is also part of the spirit world. So the medicine man who is the spirit guide for the tribe, the priest or, or, or minister if you will, is also the person that treats you for an illness. Because illnesses are thought to have a spiritual base. So if you have a fever, you're sick, you're, you're run down, uh, you're dehydrated, that's because there's a lack of balance with your spirit. And you will need prayers, <coughs> incantations, and you might need some herbs and spices and other things uh, that would uh, help. Certainly, the, the tribes have medicines that are not used to be uh, in, in the American understanding. The um, moss from a tree, for example, being placed on an open wound, seems to be able to heal those wounds. Now, I don't know why that is, but the Indians in their medicine know these things. So they're incantations, but they're also other medicines that they bring out of nature. Uh, from herbs and, uh, and other and plants and roots that are used uh, for various medicinal purposes. But usually the Americans didn't trade for those things. We thought they were savages and we had all the knowledge and information. So we died at 35 or 40. That's the lifespan of a mountain man. And the Indians lived much longer unless they were killed in battle. But we were smarter. <laughs> Who knows? Yes, ma'am. What did I charge for my toll road? Well, sometimes I wanted the extra wheels off your wagon. Sometimes I wanted a horse, some cattle, maybe one of your oxen or two. It depends on what you had. Most of these people did not have very much money when they got here. To buy a good wagon, a Dodge or a Conestoga, would take your life savings. Many of these people had sold their farms, 
gotten rid of all the furniture that wasn't on the wagon. That had been given to neighbors and friends and relatives or sold so they could make the trip. Because this was a one-way journey. They were never going back. Once they came west, it was, this was just something that was going to be a new life for them and they couldn't, couldn't go back. So I took what they had. I took, now, some didn't have money, but, but usually I traded for something that they had. Yes, ma'am? Did you ever cross paths with Jedediah Smith? Did I ever cross paths, cross with, Jedediah? paths with Jedediah Smith? Well, Jedediah Smith worked for the other trading company. Now, not that I have anything against that, but I have met him at several rendezvous. Uh, he's an interesting man. He doesn't talk very much. And there were people who said, besides being a horse thief, that I was also a big liar. And some of them, I haven't told you about the day that I ran almost 90 miles, you know, running away from a, a group of the Blackfeet that were trying to kill me. But uh, some people didn't believe my stories. Now, that may be that they lack imagination. Of course, those who had horses tended more to believe me because they were without them after we met. <laughs> yes, ma'am. In the, the, the Rocky Mountain Fur Trading Company, Moses Harris was referred to as Old Black Moses. He was a black man. And of course, being a mulatto, that's me too. And there were two or three others, but not very many. Not very many. Everyone was treated equally once you got away from civilization in St. Louis. So where there was civilization, there was discrimination. When you had to survive 15, 20, 30 men on their own in the West by themselves, you were judged by who you were and what you could do. Yes, ma'am. Do I have any inclination to go back and visit my family? Well, of course, my mother and father have passed on. Uh, several of my brothers uh, are deceased. Uh, when I have gone back to St. Louis, I have seen my sisters and their family who now have children. So I, I have traveled back a number of times, but uh, they're getting old, and I'm not sure all the way back. Now, when this new railroad is built, and I don't know, Mr. Lincoln is talking about it, if that's ever going to happen, that he's going to have a war to fight the way things are looking right now. I'm not sure there'll be money. And who would ride all the way across the country on a railroad? <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen, but if, if it does, I might be interested in doing that. That's a long ride in a horse. Four months, and I am getting a bit older. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Um, before we let this gentleman leave the stage, I would like to introduce you officially to James Armistead. <laughs> Um, James is actually, uh, Dr. Armistead, I should say, is a retired strategy, um, at, at, sorry, professor of strategy and international law from the U.S. Naval War College. He's taught, inter ready? Don't, yeah, don't get too excited yet. Ready? <laughs> I had to do this last month, too, and everybody was amazed. He has taught international law, strategy, and national security policy for nearly 40 years. Professor Armistead has served on numerous faculties including Stanford University, Pepperdine University, University of California, U.S. Naval Postgraduate School. Sounds like the guy can't get a job. That's <laughs> what <laughs> so my father said. And he also travels as a representative for the Organization for Security and Operations in Europe for the Election Observation Deployment and enjoys portraying various historical characters, such as the one you just saw, in his free time, right? Well, I'm retired. <laughs> so actually, he just came back from Kazakhstan. Yes, I'm yes? in Kazakhstan week before last. About a week ago. Oh. 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 And here he is. Um, so he's, he, we're happy to have you ask any questions um, about our current person on the stage. Anything I can answer that I couldn't do in character? A couple of you got real close to where, where I wouldn't know the answer. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can, can you tell us what happened to Jim Beckworth? 
Oh, well, like all good characters, there are two or three stories about how he meets his demise. Now, he's not quite as good as Cicero, who has two graves in Syracuse uh, in Italy. He's not quite that good. But uh, 1866, uh, he does go back to Denver. Uh, during the war, he is pulled out of his business, ends up as a scout, uh, and he's with the Colorado militia during the war uh, until about 1864, at which point he becomes disgusted after two massacres and, uh, and quits the army and goes back to his business. But Sublet sells the business in the 1850s, sometime in the mid-1850s, Sublet's gotten to be an old man, to the Suarez brothers and a consortium back in St. Louis. They know Beckworth by reputation, and when they were young men, they knew him because he worked with General Ashley, uh, whom Sublet bought the, uh, the company from. They want him to go out back to the Blackfoot and Crow area because he knows people there, his son is a minor chief, and to open up a trading post, their trading post, uh, because he's got his own business. Uh, he's got a restaurant and a small hotel and a trading post at the edge of town in Denver. So they sent him out and in October of 1866. On that expedition, he dies. Now, part of the story, uh, one of the stories is that he has a heart attack, uh, which makes sense. You know, he's 68 years old. Uh, he's led a fairly, fairly rough life. Uh, someone asked about medicines. Well, you know, this is where aspirin comes from. So if he was doing his small dose of aspirin, uh, that the Indians would have, would have, they didn't take it for heart conditions, but they had uh, acetylsalicylic acid. Uh, he could very well have died of a heart attack. That could be the case. Another story is that because he would not stay with the crow, that one of his old wives poisoned him. Oh. So that his medicine would be with the tribe, because by this time they had become weak. One of the things that he did, trading for them, I mean, he took care of himself, but trading for them, instead of whiskey, he made sure they had uh, shot and ammunition and powder and new guns, so that even as a smaller tribe, they could defend themselves against the Cheyenne, the Sioux, the Blackfoot, who were larger, uh, larger tribes, sometimes with more horses. Remember, the further west that you got, the level of horse, not only the number of horses you had was diminished, but the, the quality of the horses went down. So, you know, by the time you got to the very far west, unless you stole a horse that the mountain men brought out, these horses were not in particularly good shape. You know, the Spanish had let them get away, you know, 150 years before. Uh, they weren't really, the Indians didn't do a lot of horse breeding. Uh, modern scientific horse breeding. So they tried to steal their way to better horses. So if you knew of a tribe that had better horses, you would you would go off and uh, and do that. But does that answer that covered? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, you tried to steal better horses than you had. You know, if you had horses, your horses weren't doing well. Let's if you had a, uh, like this year in California, a very dry year. Well, you know, horses need water. They need good, good food. The grasses on the Great Plains were beginning to change about this time. And eventually, the grass you have now is essentially Russian, Siberian grass that we see growing in wild areas. The natural grasses have all have pretty much died out. They've been overcome by these other, these other plants. Mediterranean plants and Russian plants coming from both sides have really changed that. Uh, sheep on cattle ranges um, will eat the grass down to the very nubs. The grass dies out. So it's replaced by what's in the air that comes across. So we've had a, a great deal of change in the biota uh, in the last 150, 200 years. So that affects the horses, what's, what's valuable. In Nevada, there are places where it takes 100 acres to raise one steer because there's such little food value in these Siberian grasses. That's what tumbleweed is. It's these Siberian grasses. It, there's not much food value. It, it's a lot of roughage, but not very much. So it takes a lot of land to, uh, for, for the, the cattle, the horses, to, uh, to be able to graze and, and get real food value. So you stole better horses if you could get away with it. <laughs> That's how you got better ones. Yes, sir? What other characters have you got? Uh, other characters. My first, the Bedworth is my first character. So the, there was a Carson Valley. I was at the University of Nevada. And the, they were doing a Carson Valley Chautauqua. And uh, so Kit Carson, uh, Lansford Hastings, someone asked about the, uh, the Donner Party. And I mentioned 
Lancer Hastings, so a uh, Bill Crystal, who was the chaplain of the uh, for the National Guard uh, in Nevada, and uh, and a close friend. He did uh, Hastings, and I did Beckworth. Uh, that, we, that was my first character. Uh, mm -hmm. I do Benjamin O. Davis, a leader of the Tuskegee Airmen. I'll be doing that in Arkansas next month. Um, that's my 11th time in Arkansas for the Air Chautauqua. And this is their 20-year all-star. They voted back the best characters. It isn't me. It's the character they like. Uh, so I'll be doing, I'll be doing that. Uh, I have a Revolutionary War character um, who is a, a minister, a theologian. He writes 10,000 sermons, uh, travels. Uh, well, he lives until 1833, and he's at the Battle of Concord. He writes a narrative poem about the, uh, about the Battle of Lexington, uh, that's every bit as good as the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere that was lost to history for about 40 years. Yeah. And somebody stole it and tried to publish it. And his children, who had the original, sued and, uh, and won a, a common law copyright uh, uh, for him. Um, I do Major Martin Delaney, uh, who was the, uh, the first black ethnographer in the United States. Uh, he was a practicing physician, became a judge after the Civil War. He was the highest ranking black officer in the Union Army. Uh, he was a major. Um, and did a number of other interesting things. He was an explorer in Central Africa. He was the first American of any color or kind to be inducted into the Royal Explorer Society. Uh, and uh, he was proposed by Prince Albert for that after his, uh, his African expedition. Uh, then he gets home in time for the, uh, for the Civil War. Uh, noted for, uh, for fighting diseases and staying uh, with yellow fever uh, in Baltimore where he practiced uh, when all the other doctors left. Uh, he went to the Harvard Medical School for three weeks and the father of Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, the soldier and later uh, justice of the Supreme Court, was the dean of the Harvard Medical School. He was given a letter by the other students who said there were three black members of the class of, uh, of 1851. Uh, that those three black members would reduce the quality of education and the white students wanted them removed. Uh, Dean Holmes came to him and said, listen, we'd really like it if you would resign. There's no reason to put you out. You're doing great work. And he'd already been a practicing physician for 15 years. He had studied. Uh, you understudied uh, in those days with doctors. That's how most of the people, as, as with, with law, that you read law. Uh, Adams read law with Putnam. It's a famous relationship. Uh, and that's how that was done. But he was asked to leave. But he was at Harvard for three weeks. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not sure those other doctors, their, their education was diminished. I'm not quite sure what it was they thought they were going to lose. But, uh, uh, but he, he went on to lead, lead a very interesting life. Um, Henry Flipper, who was the, the, the first black graduate of the military academy, Buffalo soldier, uh, who has an interesting life and ends up as the counsel for the Senate Interior Committee, a non-lawyer, he's an engineer. But he gets out of the army he, in Arizona. He becomes an expert on Spanish land grant law and Mexican land grant law, which are very different. And of course, being trained as an engineer, mining companies were very interested in his services. He spoke very good Spanish. And the president of the company he worked for became eventually the uh, chairman of the Senate Interior Committee and hired him as, the, uh, uh, as, its, uh, as its counsel. Uh, I do um, Matthew Henson, who was the, uh, the, the first uh, person to, uh, to arrive at the North Pole. Uh, he was with, with Perry, but he was leading the expedition. He was uh, about three hours in front of Perry, uh, arriving at the, uh, at the pole. He designs the, uh, the clothing that was used. I mean, he looked at all the things. They wore wool and cotton. And of course, if you spend time outside in bad weather, uh, if this gets wet, you're in real trouble. So he said, well, the Eskimos seem to live out there and the, all the time. What do they do? The, the sealskin pants, the fur parkas. So he designed expedition clothing for the expedition based on the, uh, the, the several earlier expeditions where they, uh, they lived with the Eskimos and worked with them. Um, and did that. I do, um, let's see, where are we? We're up to the First World War. Uh, Charles Young, who was the first superintendent of Yosemite, uh, he was with the, uh, the, the 9th, the 10th Cavalry, and the, all, all four of the regular Army black regiments uh, from the Civil War until uh, 1950, the 24th and 25th Infantry and the 9th and 10th Cavalry. He was with all four. He commanded a battalion of the 9th Cavalry in Mexico and twice rode the Pershing's rescue and saved his life. Uh, Patton, as a first lieutenant, gets promoted and taken to Europe. 
Uh, Young, they refused to promote the general. He was eligible to be promoted in 1916. Uh, and they found that he had rheumatic fever and that he was too weak to serve. Uh, so he got on his horse. He was a professor at Wilberforce, the professor of military science. He got on his horse in the middle of winter and he rode it to Washington, D.C., reported to the Surgeon General, who decided, well, maybe you aren't as sick as we thought. <laughs> so but they still didn't promote him, but they sent him off to the Philippines. But he, he wanted a combat command in France. Um, I do Benjamin O. Davis Sr., although I've only done him one time. Uh, the father of Benjamin O. Davis Jr. Who was the first black general in the U.S. Army. Uh, he commanded the 4th Cavalry Brigade at the beginning of the Second World War, but he was in the Philippines. He served from 1898 until 1946. So he had a, a, quite a, a long and, and distinguished, uh, distinguished career. Uh, well, <laughs> well, I've got 13 characters that I do, so, but, but those are the principal ones. <laughs> yes, sir. Anything else I can answer before I go? Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, I speak French passably and read it reasonably well. I speak German. I spent a year in the German army, so I, my, my Germans, and I spoke no German when I got that assignment. I came, I came late to a meeting. I speak a little bit of Polish, uh, and I, I was on the team that negotiated Poland and the NATO, uh, in Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Montenegro, uh, Hungary, the Czech Republic, uh, so I worked on those, uh, those things. Uh, I, I can understand a little Italian. I went to school in Italy. So the school for law professors uh, that I did there. And, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Now you said your name is Armstead. Yes, sir. Any relation to the general that the Civil War? Well, actually, I have an ancestor, James Armstead, for whom I am named, who was owned by the Armistead family, an I. Uh, my grandfather dropped the I. But that, that James Armistead, uh, who was owned by the family, earned his freedom, uh, left the, uh, the plantation he was working under Virginia, uh, became associated with the Marquis de Lafayette, and carried the battle plan, which laid out all the embankments, the embrasures, and the, the cannonade positions at the Battle of Yorktown. So when the Armsteads get together and talk about America being our country, we're serious. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I guess that's it. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.